Okay, I'm I'm awake, kind of. Oh boy. Okay, your floor is dirty. My floor is not dirty. It's just full of cat toys. Okay, all the students, my future game students, please react to the to the lecture two message if you are present. Find some some nice emote or or whatever. Cloud Cat is a very good emote. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm a little bit late. I need to clean my glasses and open Photoshop and that kind of stuff. But you know there are cats, so I figured I would start a little a little early anyway. Sort of on time. <sighs> okay. See, Salad sleeps like that. Just, <laughs> that's his default pose. Um, he just, he's just always like that. We'll find him at random locations in the apartment with random orientations, but mostly, mostly on his back. Is it chubby little boy or just fluffy? You know, I think science has yet to figure out which. I'll be able to do today's lecture. Um, I am very sleep deprived. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to do face cam when there's a cuter, cuter cat to, to post the camera on. Maybe we don't need face cam, you know? Okay, let's open Photoshop. How did the assignments go? Did you did you manage to do them all or just a few or was it too easy? Was it too hard? Actually, accidentally shoved my sandwich onto the floor and it landed right side up. I don't know how that happened. Okay, let's see. So you did all of them. One and two down, one and two down. Mm, did all the needed help for number three. Um, you're one thing away from solving number two several times for several hours. <laughs> Interested to see how others solve number two? Yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a puzzle. Um, but I think it's a good puzzle. Like usually this is something you would just look up, copy paste some code, um, or use Unity's function. Um, but I think the, I think it's good for building intuitions about how the dot product works. Spoilers, you have to use the dot product to solve number two. Uh, number two was the 
uh, bouncing laser, where you have to write your own uh, reflection function. Sorry, sorry for still eating breakfast. Almost done. Maybe I shouldn't have started early. <laughs> Maybe I should have just started late. Okay. I have eaten breakfast. I'm now ready to face the world. All right. Oh yeah, we're gonna need Unity. So let's fire up Unity. Okay, yeah, number number three is a little bit more complicated. Um, I wish I kind of rushed it near the end when talking about different spaces um, because that is kind of a it can be kind of hard to wrap your head around, and it's something you're gonna probably get wrong many times over uh, forever and ever because I mean I do <laughs> and it's it can be confusing sometimes to deal with many different spaces and what coordinates even mean in those different spaces um, and so that's why I kind of considered it to be more of a bonus assignment because we didn't have too much time to, to talk about that but we will during during this lecture um, Okay, so the the, uh, the first assignment was to um, create a radial trigger, as in something that can detect whether or not something else is within its own radius of a given size, right? So that was the first assignment. So let's let's just do that. Um, I'm gonna disable a few things and just create a new new object. Um, all right, so let's see, we have a radial trigger. Um, and then we need some object to test with. So we can use, reuse this one. Um, all right, so let's make a script. Oh, okay. Hitting return didn't work that time because why not? Keyboard focus. bread all over my mouth. It's probably my fault for putting bread in my mouth. That was the that was the first mistake. All right. So, the first assignment is to create an object that can detect whether or not something else is within a given radius. Um, so, first off, we need something to determine the radius, right? So, we're just going to create a public field that should be configurable. And then as usual, it's nice to do debugging in on draw gizmos because you don't have to press play. Everything is running every frame the scene view renders. Um, and so it can be useful whenever you're debugging stuff like this. Um, and so, so first off, we might want to draw this radius just, to, just so we can see what's going on. Um, so we can draw things using either uh, the gizmos functions. So we have gizmos.draw. Uh, wire sphere, we can use that in this case. 
Um, but there's also functions in a class called handles. Um, so in handles, we have, um, let's see, I, I forget if there is, yeah, I think there's an arc. Yeah, so we can do a wire arc if we want to. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, but handles has a lot more functions than gizmos. Um, so if you want to want to have some more advanced like debug drawing functions, uh, handles has a few more of those. Uh, so I recommend looking into that. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, that you're not going to be able to make a build in Unity unless you um, if def this out. Um, so you can do if Unity editor and if just to exclude this code um, in builds. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much C sharp you've done, um, but this this is one way to just exclude editor specific code from your game. Um, so this is basically going to take this away and take this away uh, once you're making a build. Handles does not work in runtime, no. Well, it works in runtime, but it only works in editor. So in builds, it's not going to work. But it will work in the game view and when pressing play. Um, anyway, we're not going to make builds, uh, so I'm not going to clutter up this code, but something to keep in mind. No, editor requirements is only for handles, not for gizmos. Gizmos are, I think, automatically stripped somehow. Um, or they just never call the gizmos function. Um, okay, so we want to draw the sphere. So we can do gizmos.draw wire sphere is probably the easiest function. So we want to draw it at the location of this object. So let's make a variable for that. Um, transform dot position. Uh, so we have the center, and then we need the radius, which is just our variable. Draw dot line is also great if you can get shapes. This is true. I highly recommend getting shapes. One of my favorite plugins on the asset store. If you want even better drawing functions, but you know. All right, so we have our trigger, and we can set the radius of this one, and you can see that it changes. So. We have our we have our trigger, and it's also spherical because we're drawing a sphere. Um, but then whether or not it's going to be spherical in our math implementation depends on how we implement it. Um, but I think for now we're just going to stick to 2D. So I'm going to stay in this in this 2D view. Okay, so now we need to check if A is inside or outside of this trigger. Um, and for this exercise, we're not going to make it like general to detect like any objects. We can just hard code it to uh, detect one specific transform. Uh, what do we call this? Maybe player. It's a player that's that we might be detecting. Um, okay. So we need the the player position. So player position, player dot position. Um, all right, so we have the center of the trigger and we have the position of the player. Uh, so in order for us to check if we're inside or outside of this, all we really need to do is to check the distance between the trigger and the player and then compare it to the radius. Because if the distance is shorter than the radius, it means we're inside. If it's greater than the radius, we're outside. If it's exactly the radius, we're right on the edge. And and for that case, we just have to make some decision about what we prefer. Um, if on the edge should count as inside or outside. Um, a literal edge case. <clears throat> uh, just my understanding, I tried to make any generic yesterday, only to realize I would have to go through every scene, every object in the scene. Is there a more optimized way of making sure making your own trigger system, like using quad trees or something? Um, so the um, the built-in physics system of Unity does have this ki these kinds of optimizations already. Um, so it w the cheapest way would probably just be to use like kinematic rigid bodies to detect trigger interaction, uh, because that is already built into the physics system. Um, 
But if you know exactly which objects are going to do this, you don't have to go through the physics system. Um, you could just iterate through the objects that you know can trigger this. Um, and then if you, which direction you want to do this in is kind of up to you. If you want to do it using quad trees and whatnot, that can optimize it as well if you have like a huge number of things. Um, but if you only have like 20 units or whatever that you're comparing with, then it's probably going to be fine to do it even without quad trees. Um, Salad? Do not. Sorry, I have a criminal behind my monitor who's eating cables. Oh, and please remind me to drink water, because I am so bad at remembering to do that. Okay. Um, so we have the center of the trigger, we have the uh, player position, and now we need to get the distance between these two. And getting the distance, there are many ways of doing that. Um, we can either do it manually, or we can use the built-in functions. Um, <clears throat> so the usual way is to just use the built-in function because it's easier. So you would use vector3.distance, and then we check the distance from the uh, center of our trigger to the uh, player position. All right. And so if the distance is less than or equal to the radius, then that means we're inside. Okay, and then we might want to draw it differently just so we can like check um, whether or not it's working because it's kind of hard to tell what the value of this bool is. Um, so one way we can do that is we, we can set the color of the gizmo. Um, so um, let's set the gizmo color. So if it's inside, we want to set it to um, color.white and if it's outside, we do color.red. Okay, and that should be it. So let's go back. Uh, it's not drawing at all. Why is it not drawing at all? Oh, because player is null. This is our player. Player is now blue. Okay, so now it's red and there we go. Seems to work. You can move the trigger around as well. And the distance test is working fine. And if we change the radius, still working. And that's that's how you do do that one. Um, now there is a very common optimization that you can do with this type of check. <coughs> um, So when we are checking the distance, uh, we're currently checking the exact distance, like the literal Euclidean distance, the, the full way that we did it before. Um, so um, basically what, what that is doing is we're getting the, um, the delta between those two positions, um, sometimes called the displacement. Um, so the displacement is sometimes just referred to as a, the difference between two positions or two vectors. Um, so if we do center minus player position, um, delta is shorter. I like short names for variables. So, so then what we're doing to calculate the distance is the square root of delta dot x, and then we square that. It's the same as the Pythagorean theorem, right? Um, and then we do delta dot y, square that, delta dot x, and, or sorry, z. If we're doing 3D, I suppose, in this case we're doing 3D, so throwing in z. All right, so, so this, is, this is the formula to get the distance between two vectors. We calculate the delta, and then we get the length of this delta vector. Um, now... The, oh, one thing to note is that um, I saw some of you were using the uh, pow function, which is the raising something to the power of something else. Um, so we could do uh, delta dot 
um, x and then to the power of 2. Um, so you can do this as well if you want to square things. Uh, but keep in mind that math.pal is actually supports floating point uh, exponents. So you can do 2.5. Um, and the side effect of that is that this one is actually doing more advanced math and more expensive math than simply multiplying it by itself. Um, multiplying it by itself is a lot cheaper in many cases. Uh, so I recommend doing this rather than calling the pow function. Um, I usually reserve the pow function only when I have uh, fractional uh, or decimal um, exponents. Um, so just something to keep in mind if you want to keep things fast. Um, would it be better to not use square root since the operation is comparative? Uh, yes, that is exactly what I'm about to explain. Um, so, like you mentioned, the, in this case, the square root is actually not really necessary. Um, and when we look at this, the, the square root is actually one of the most expensive operations um, among everything we're doing in this code. Uh, the square root is complicated to, to evaluate. Um, and so we, um, what we can do is that we can actually omit this completely. Um, and then we end up with something that's usually called the squared distance uh, because it's the distance to the power of 2. Um, and then instead of comparing it to the radius, we compare it to the square of the radius. So now we've removed the need to do the... Um, we remove the need to do the uh, square root, but we're still comparing it to the radius and everything works the same. It's just that we don't actually have the correct distance anymore, but that doesn't matter because all we need to check is if, if it's less than or greater than a certain threshold. And if that threshold is also squared, um, then it's gonna work. Um, oh, were the cat ears a lie? It was not, actually, I just forgot. Promised cat ears if you solved 3b, so hold on. Sorry about that. Okay. There we go. Um, a bounding box is different, so I have to like adjust the camera. Okay, um, and so this is, this is a very, very common optimization. Uh, so if we go back, we can just test to make sure everything works. And then it seems to work fine. Then we can increase the radius, and it seems to work fine. Uh, not just in terms of optimization, but also in terms of precision, isn't square distance better? Um, I don't think so. I don't know if there's a significant precision difference there. I guess it depends on how large the values are or how small they are. Um, I'm not sure, actually. I haven't, I haven't checked, so. Um, and yes, like, um, like Nestor is mentioning, uh, you can also type this as the dot product. Um, so as you can see, we're, this looks very similar to the dot product, right? We have a vector, we, we take the x component squared, y component squared, and multiply it, um, multiply them one by one and then add them all up. Uh, but with the dot product, uh, these would be two different vectors, right? We would have a and b. Um, but in this case, they're the same vector. So if you want the squared length of a vector, um, you can do the dot product with the vector itself, and then you will get the squared distance. Um, so in this case, we could do vector 3 of dot, uh, delta, delta. Uh, and this is also a common way to um, express a lot of these different mathematical functions without referring to the components. Because quite often when you write math, you want to write formulas that work for both 2D and 3D, and so it can be nice to use functions like this to just use the dot product because then it's kind of dimension independent. Like this works, this works even for like five dimensional vectors. You can still just use the, um, the dot product between the two to get the squared distance. Uh, not that you would use five dimensional vectors in, in games, but you know. 
Okay, so this is a common optimization. We're checking the square distance instead of the um, distance. <clears throat> um, oh, um, and so, um, and of course, a lot of things like this are built in. So you can do delta dot squared magnitude if you want to. <clears throat> Doesn't really matter that much. This one is a little bit more readable. I think if people are aware what squared magnitude is. Salad, can you stop eating kibbles? What exactly did the dot method do again? Um, in this case or in general? Because in this case, this gives you the squared length of the vector delta. I don't want my cat to eat cables. I feel like this is bad times. Okay, did that make sense? Ow, ow, ow. No, salad. Hey, I'm sending you to cat jail soon. There's too many criminal activities. <sighs> Why don't you use delta.normalized? Um, because we don't need the... So delta.normalized would give us the direction um, from one to the other. Um, but we don't really need the direction. We need the length, right? Um, because we're, we're, we only... The direction doesn't actually matter. Like even if, like whichever direction we're going in. Um, Jesus Christ salad. Ow, ow, ow. <laughs> ow. Oh my goodness. Um, but yeah, so, so we just need the distance. We don't, we don't need the, the direction because it's the same regardless of which direction. So more intense to use, uh, Oh, is it more expensive to use Bats dot square root or POW 0.5? Um, I'm guessing POW 0.5 is more expensive because it's more general. Uh, the more general a function is, generally, it's also more expensive. Um, I'm guessing the square root function can probably take some shortcuts that POW 0.5 can't take. Um, it's a guess, but it's a relatively well-educated guess. So. So vector three dot dot is the same thing as doing an a dot x um, plus a dot y. Yes, if you use the same vector. So go back to our math class document. Ow, Jesus Christ. Ow, I'm bleeding. <laughs> Goodness, can't you, you two should go, go nap. I'll stop terrorizing my, my lectures. Um, the dot product, where did we put the dot product? Oh, here it is. So this is the dot product. The dot product between A and B, you take the X components of each vector, multiply them together, and then you add the Y components, multiply together. Uh, but in this case, A and B are the same vector. Um, so then we're effectively doing A dot X squared plus A dot Y squared. Um, if you remember the um, Pythagorean theorem, that's exactly what we're doing here, right? We're taking each component and we're squaring them. Uh, and that way, uh, where did I put here? And that way we get the, the distance if we just take the square root. But in this case, we're omitting the square root. So now it's the distance squared rather than the square root. Um, okay. If that makes sense. Uh, I tend to use logs to calculate square root or cube roots whenever needed. It makes it way more cheaper. Really? I would be very surprised if that's the case. I would expect the built-in functions to be faster. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, I keep getting confused by public, private, and serialized field. Uh, is there a reason for you wanting to have the radius public? Um, because it's easy and it doesn't really matter in this case. Um, like, I'm not going to think too much about code structure and whatnot. Just now when we're doing this as a like testing situation, just to learn things. Um, in the real world, maybe you want to care a little bit more. Uh, some things you don't want to expose. Some things you want to show in the inspector but not make public and so forth. Um, but it's a little bit outside of the scope of this um, this course. <clears throat> okay. Um. Any questions about this? About the the first assignment before we move on to the. The next assignment. Uh, for NPC chess interactions, is it better to use distance or unity triggers? And is it better for the object or the player to check? Um, is it better for the object or the player to check? Um, I don't think there's a difference between the two, unless it's a situation of like many to one or one to many. Um, I don't think it matters that much which direction you do it in. Um, and then whether or not to use distance or unity triggers, um, I guess it depends on the complexity of your scene. I would guess the unity triggers are, um, I'm not sure which actually. I feel like both have advantages, advantages and disadvantages. Um, and it would depend on, um, it would depend, I think. Because a player would just be one, but you'd have many objects checking. Yeah, but you would still have to check each relationship, regardless of which one is checking in what direction, right? Uh, can't you utilize multiple threads with calculations? Uh, yes, but we're not going to do that in this course. But yeah, you can do that. Um, there are lots of ways you can optimize things like this. Um, you can do multiple threads. You can do bucketing with like, um, what's it called? Shit, like octrees and whatnot. Um, there's a word for this. Someone mentioned it earlier. Um, uh, but yeah, basically acceleration structures to, to make lookup faster and to cold things you don't need to do and so forth. Um, but again, it gets kind of messy and complicated, so. Yeah, but the, there there are many ways of optimizing it. But it's hard to give one answer as for like which one is better or worse, um, I would say. Uh, when I did it before, I just put a trigger on the player that detected an NPC so that it interacts with bull. Um, yep, that works. No! Hey! This boy. No. He was eating my transformation gizmo. Illegal. Illegal. Thought they were looking a little too excited. Okay. Um, all right. No more questions about about this one. Um, oh yeah, look triggers. Um, I actually usually have that as an assignment as well. Um, and we're probably going to do that after we've gone through trigonometry. Um, so we, we are going to make a look trigger too. But you can do that using just the dot products. Okay. All right. Um, 
I think we're ready to move on to the to the next one then. Salad is such a gremlin. Like they're they're fighting right now. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Uh, can you make a half sphere, quarter sphere in such in gizmos? Uh, you can do it using handles, but not in gizmos. Um, there's a handles dot draw wire arc. Um, so you can use that one to draw like circular arcs. But in terms of spheres, like this one is just a 2D, like in a plane. But uh, for a sphere, it's more complicated, so that doesn't doesn't exist. Can you use it as a trigger? Um, use what as a trigger? The arc itself? Uh, you would have to write the math for that. Um, and that's going to be an assignment uh, later. I think. I usually have it as, as an assignment, but... Uh, all right. No more questions about this one, I presume. I think we're ready to move to the next one. We also need a bigger canvas. Where's, where's the solid color? There we go. This is a good background color. Okay. I need to organize this a little bit. Lecture one, there we go. Layers are complicated. Um. <clears throat> Didn't make us any years back in uni, blocking with shield, something about checking the angle be between player and enemy, then see if it's within 90 to negative 90 degrees of the player's forward vector. Yes. So, uh, like I mentioned last stream, uh, you can use the dot product to check. So if we have two vectors, we have the, the red one, A, and then we have the blue one, B. Um, if these two vectors are normalized, if both of them have a length of one, then you, the value you get out of the dot product is kind of a measure of how similar the vectors are. If they're pointing in the same direction, the value is 1. If they're pointing in the opposite direction, the value is negative 1. And then all the values in between are interpolated. Um, and so if, you, if we imagine uh, this one right here, um, like this, um, this would be, have a value um, of like uh, 0.6 or something like that. Um, and then if you do another one, like this one, then this would then decrease. So this would be a value like 0.2 uh, and so forth, all the way until zero. And then you get, on the other side, you get um, values of like negative 0.2 and so forth. Um, and so if you're making a shield and you wanted to only block like bullets from the front, uh, then you would check the dot product between the shield direction and the uh, bullet direction. And then you can use the value of the dot product to figure out if it's in front of or behind it, right? <clears throat> and for backstabs, yes, you can use it for backstabs too. Anything where you need to check this type of directional relationship, right? Now, one thing to keep in mind is that these are not angles. Uh, just keep that in mind. Um, would you need to normalize the bullet direction then? Uh, yes, they would have to be normalized for this relationship to hold. Uh, if they're not normalized, it's going to be scaled and biased in, in a certain direction. Um, yeah. Uh, can you use it for aerial attacks to see if you're above the enemy like in Sekiro? Um, yes, you can do that. Any Anytime you need to check a deviation from a direction, um, you can use that. It's kind of It's kind of independent of which... Uh, how many dimensions you have. So it works in 3D as well. Uh, the thing in 3D, though, is that um, if you're checking a threshold, in 2D, you're effectively uh, checking if something is within a symmetrical like region like this that stretches uh, to infinity, right? 
So you're checking if something is within this when you're doing this type of operation, right? Um, but if you're in 3D, uh, then uh, it's a it's a sphere, right? Uh, all of the unit vectors is like on on a sphere. Uh, I don't know how to draw a wire sphere. Um, and then what you're checking is no longer just a 2D slice like this, uh, but you're you're rather checking a uh, the cap of a like a like a cone with a rounded cap, right? Then you're checking if something is within this volume. Um, assuming you're checking something against this vertical vector and then some other v vector, which might be the um, the direction the player is moving or, or whatever, right? Um, yeah. Um, if you're doing it for like a bullet, the bullet is coming from the opposite direction. Can you compare the two then? Uh, yes, you would just have to interpret the result differently. Um, or you can just negate the vector. Um, then you could just say, well, I want the, the interval, you know, uh, from negative one to negative 0.8 or something. Maybe you want that to be your, your region of um, giving positive versus negative values, right? So this is, this is very common whenever you're doing things like, um, you're talking about stealth games, like the vision cone for stealth game, classic use case for, for this, type of, uh, this type of math. Um, is a math book page on your website? Um, I don't think I actually link it. No. Um, but uh, there's the link if you want. Voice. There's some very fast voice in the background. Okay. Um, now I spoiled the look trigger. Um, all right, should we move on to the bouncing laser? Lots of typing. Oh yeah, uh, breaks. Um, oh geez, kind of an awkward time. I think we can talk about the the bouncing laser, but yes, we should we should do a five minute break every every um, every hour. Okay, um, but let's let's. I think we we should start. Let's let's go for the um, our laser. Okay, first we need some objects to bounce against. So I just need, I'm just gonna slap in a few objects. Should probably turn off the old stuff. Beautiful. Uh, Cause we need some colliders to test this against. The kittens are flying around the apartment right now. <laughs> I feel like I'm going back to my level artist days. It's almost nostalgic. Moving objects, rotating meshes. Great. What a situation then it's always good to make sure that all of these have a Z position of zero if we're doing 2D. Um, if not, you're gonna have a fun time debugging that um, as your laser suddenly disappears and you're wondering why. Um, okay, we have our environment. So now, kinda wanna group that, it's a little messy. Let's just shove it into a game object. Boop. Okay, so now I want to make a laser. Okay. 
Uh, I don't know which break length we're going for. I was I was assuming we should do five minutes. Um. Feel called out for the three D comment. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was there, and I was as confused as you are. So. All right, let's give this a label. Okay. It was a sneaky problem. All right, lasers. Um, all right, as usual, uh, we're gonna want our trusty on draw gizmos function because I'm lazy. I don't want to. I don't want to have to press play and wait for things to start. I just want to draw things immediately. Okay, cats are flying about. Fallon, hey, <laughs> boy. They're, they have zoomies right now. Okay, um, on draw gizmos. So let's first decide uh, what direction the laser should move in. Um, it's kind of convenient to use the game object uh, axes, right? Like you have the X axis and the Y axis. And so then we can just rotate the laser to change the direction of the laser. Uh, and so when you have an object selected, um, and your pivot pivot is orientation is set to uh, local, then the red arrow represents the x-axis of that object, um, and so so we can utilize that to get our direction of our uh, laser, right? Um, so we're gonna set the direction to uh, transform dot uh, right. So right is the x-axis. All right, and we might want to do vector two rather than vector three because we're doing a 2D scene. Um, all right, and then we can, of course, debug this if we want to. So gizmos, draw, line. Um, so we have our the position of this object, so maybe we should cache that too. Origin, let's transform that position. So we want to draw a line from the origin to origin plus direction. Uh, you can also use gizmos.drawRay if you want to. Uh, in that case, you, you can emit the uh, origin here, and then it's just drawing the um, drawing it as a ray. But personally, I just like using draw line um, because it makes more sense in my head. Um, OK, so now we should have a line drawing along the x-axis. And we do. So now we have this little white line. So this is going to be the direction of our laser. All right, so the assignment was to first use Unity's raycast to trace the scene, uh, detect uh, ray intersections with colliders. Uh, so we're going to use raycasts. And then we need to solve the problem of what is the math to effectively bounce a vector. Um, so uh, let's, let's do our raycast. Um, so Raycasts return true or false depending on whether or not they hit something, right? If they return false, they missed. So that means our laser has like, like shot out into space. Uh, so we're gonna put our raycast in an if statement. So we're gonna do physics dot raycast, um, and the raycast is gonna want a ray. So I'm gonna change this from uh, instead of having two vector twos, I'm gonna store this in a ray instead. Um, I guess ray has, has vector vector threes. I don't know if we can use 2D raycasts, but I guess we will do 3D raycasts. It's fine. Um, so then we're going to make a ray out of this. We're going to pass an origin and direction. Um, and then we pass that into the raycast function. 
there are like a million overloads for this one. Um, and so in this case, what we're interested in is uh, we just want the hit information. We don't really care about like masking which objects or the maximum distance or all of that. Uh, so we're just gonna uh, output the raycast hit um, struct. Okay, so now we are raycasting the uh, we are raycasting from the position of this object in the direction of the x-axis of this object. And then hit now contains the information about the location that that raycast hit. Um, what? Oh, right. I don't have shapes installed. I'm so used to using shapes. Um, gizmos dot draw line. Uh, so we want to draw the uh, draw something at the location it hit. We can just start with a sphere. Uh, draw a sphere, and we want to draw it at hit dot point. So that's the world space location that it hit. Um, and we need to give it a radius. I guess some some little radius like that. Uh, we need to find raycast hit in the if statement. What's its scope? Um, I forget if it's inside of the block or after the block. I think it's after. Yeah, you do have access to it after the block as well. Um, so the the out basically means that it's going to output a. It's going to also going to set a variable when executing this function. Um, so right now we're both setting and defining the variable, uh, but you could do it outside if you want to. Uh, so we could define the variable here, and then we output into the variable. Um, but in this case, we're, I'm just inlining it because I think the code looks a little bit cleaner that way. Um, and so we basically, basically the raycast function populates um, everything that has an out parameter. So this one is going to get data from the raycast function. It's very useful whenever you want to output more than just one thing. Um, it's commonly used for cases like this, where it returns a, a Boolean for whether or not it succeeded or failed, uh, and then you get extra information if it succeeded. It's very commonly used for that. Uh, isn't it easier to use gizmos.drawArray? Um, yep, you can do that if you want. I just prefer not to. Um, okay. So now we're drawing a sphere. And as you can see, we have a sphere where the raycast is hitting. And that seems to work. We can rotate it, and it traces out the environment just fine. Um, and now I think it's time for our five-minute break. So let's take a five-minute break until until ten o'clock. Um, <sighs> Didn't know you could raycast outside of play mode. Um, you can you can raycast whenever you want. Um, there's nothing there's nothing special about play mode in general. Um, it's something you like learn a lot whenever whenever you start doing like editor scripting. Um, you kind of realize that after a while that everything everything is just running at all times. It's just that play mode has some extra simulation bits in it. Um, but there's but there's really nothing special about play mode in that sense. All the functions you can call in play mode, you can call while editing as well. Um, for better or worse, uh, sometimes you can like destructively edit things in editor code. Um, and so you might want to be careful about what you do. Like you, you might not want to modify objects in here, but yeah. Okay. Salad. There are so many cats. What what is what is this? Hello. Ow. 
I thought move towards needed the game to run. Um, well, you just you just need to increment the parameter over time, and when the game is running, time is incrementing. Uh, but when the editor is running, the in-game time is not incrementing. Uh, but if you're using a different input value to your move towards uh, that is incrementing, even though you're not playing the game, um, then um, it's going to work fine. Um, yours isn't working. Um, that's weird. Uh, I would check the rotations of your objects um, because it's it, it is pointing toward the x-axis so make sure that the x-axis of this object is pointing in the right direction make sure your pivot is set to local and not global um, and make sure that everything is on the xy plane remember to drink water true thanks Uh, it looks like you have a collider on your laser, do you? There's like a green box around your around your laser, so it might be hitting itself. Oh, it's not active. Um, It looks like it should work. Um, same situation for you. Uh, that is weird. Are your objects using... Um, so first off, yeah, make sure Z position is zero for everything. Look at it in 3D to make sure that it's actually hitting it. Because uh, it's possible in 2D that it might be offset and you're not noticing it. Uh, the other thing would be to uh, make sure that you're using the 3D colliders and not the 2D colliders. Because we're using the 3D raycast function. Um, if we're using the 2D raycast function, you have to use the uh, 2D colliders. My finger is hurting. <laughs> I'm actually bleeding. All zero and 3D colliders, that's bizarre. Oh, you got it? What was it? Isn't this a very pristine loaf? Look at this loaf. Isn't this one of the loafs you've ever seen? Oh, the parent object had a z-value? Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a very good little loaf. I mean, they're not in loaf loaf position, but it's a very good poof. Goodness, the kittens are like racing around right now. <laughs> hey, no, not my electronics. I don't want you rummaging about over there. There's a non-zero chance they're gonna unplug my entire setup. He's literally named Dark Loaf. Nice. <laughs> yeah, they were sleepy yesterday. I don't know why they have so much energy today. 
like what what is what is up with these boys I think we're accidentally turning this into a 10 minute break because cats. Bellin, where's your brother? Where's your brother? Experiencing massive cat envy, oh no. House is a mess. Yes, it's a bit of a mess because we have kittens. They, they, their toys are all like pieces of trash. They don't care too much about actual cat toys. <laughs> Boys, where are wrestling. Okay. Did you know that turtle shell cats are about ninety nine percent female? Yes, calico cats, right? Okay. All right. We should resume. Let's resume. We've done a 10 minute break. I feel like five minute breaks are very short. Um, how does five minutes pass so quickly? I don't get it. I think the kittens are calming down now, so I think we can resume. React to the message to show your presence. Bonus points if your emote is cute. Keeping track of bonus points. Um, at least let's pretend I am. Okay. Has so many reacts. <laughs> okay. I wonder how many students we have. If if the amount of emotes we got is proportional to the the amount of amount of students. Damn, a lot more than I thought. Um, cool. Okay. Um, so let's continue with the laser. So we've done the first part. We've done the ray cast to detect the uh, location it hits, right? Um, and so now at this point, now you need to solve the problem of bouncing it. And bouncing it was kind of the, the core of this assignment of trying to figure out uh, how do we uh, bounce a vector. And whenever you need to solve problems like this, um, it is very, very, very useful to start sketching this on paper. Uh, or you can do it with code if you want to. Um, but there's a problem solving process involved here that I think is, it can be good to structure it in in, in a kind of input output way. Um, and so pay to win lectures. Yes. <laughs> you get better grades, the better emotes you have. So you better have nitro. Um, all right. So, um, what we want to do here is that we have some, some surface, right? And we have a laser that is moving in some direction. So let's say that we have the direction of our laser. Let's call that D 
for direction. Um, and then it's going to hit some surface somewhere, right? So this is our surface. Um, and then when bouncing, um, we talked about it a little bit last time, but there's a, uh, every point on a surface has something called a normal. Uh, and so this is a vector pointing directly out from the surface. In other words, it's perpendicular to uh, the surface. And so this is called a normal vector. And it's generally also normalized. It has a length of one. In other words, it's a unit vector. Um, and again, our ray is a direction, which means that it's also a unit vector, usually. Uh, so we're dealing with two unit vectors. Um, and then let's see, what, what other information do we have? We know the point it hit from the ray cast. Uh, so we do have that too. Um, so we can just mark that. Um, so when you're solving problems like this, I think it's always good to try to think about what information do you have and what is your expected result. And so what I've done now is basically I've just added the information we have. We have the direction of the ray. Uh, we also have the origin of the ray. Um, so let's just add that. Um, and we have the point from the ray cast because we're doing a ray cast and we get the actual point it hit. Um, and then we also, from the ray cast struct, we also get the normal of that point. Um, and so if we, we go here, we have hit.normal. Uh, so this is the normal vector of the surface. Uh, so we do have access to that as well. And, and so now we can try to figure out, okay, so what is the result we're expecting? Um, so we can sort of intuit this, right? Like we, we sort of know how bouncing works. Um, so if it's moving in this direction, I would expect the output to be in this direction, right? Um, so this is kind of the result that we want, the, the desired uh, reflected uh, vector. So let's call this, let's call this R, or maybe lowercase, but that looks like a radius. I don't know, maybe we're radical. Let's just do, do R. Okay. Um, and so, so now when we're solving this, I feel like the um, now we can try to like arrange this in ways that um, allow us to maybe spot some symmetries or some aspects of this that um, might be hard to see if you're not drawing this. Um, and so one thing we can do is to realize that the, uh, the position of these objects doesn't actually matter. Um, if, we, if we rotate this direction, so maybe we're rotating this one, so we're firing the laser in some other direction, um, the way it bounces doesn't depend on the world space position of where it hit um, or where it came from. Uh, all we need, all, all we really care about is the direction it moved in and the normal of the surface. Uh, because that's the, the information that we're getting out of the raycast and that should be enough to calculate this direction. Uh, we're going to need the origin to set the origin of the ray, but to get the reflected direction, um, the only thing that's relevant is the uh, incoming direction and the normal. And so every, all of the other information doesn't actually matter. Uh, so one thing we can do is then to arrange this a little bit differently because again, uh, vectors don't really have an origin. Uh, rays have an origin and a direction, but vectors just have you know the numbers that they, they contain, which can be um, either a direction or a, a position, but not it doesn't contain both. Um, and so if we put this vector here, so this is again the same same direction, this is D. Um, and then we need to figure out how do we get this bounced direction. So there are a few thing you, things you might notice here. Um, the bounced direction here um, is actually a mirror symmetry to this vector. 
like you can see that the distance here, uh, well, theoretically, it would be the same if I drew this a little bit better, uh, but it should be the same as that distance there. In other words, the angles here should be the same. Um, so if we if we lower this one, let's say we, we have an incoming direction that's lower, uh, then we would get a lower direction here, and then the, uh, the outgoing direction would also be lower, right? And so you might be able to see that they are mirror images of each other along this plane or the ground. Um, and so what we can then do is try to figure out a way to mirror this vector based off of the normal, because we're kind of using the normal to mirror this one, right? Um, so how do we do that? Well, uh, like I mentioned, they, their distance here uh, should be the same. Um, and I should probably draw this one to actually be a little bit more accurate so that we don't get too confused. I don't know, life is hard. <laughs> is that close enough? Um, okay, and so now we need to figure out uh, what is this distance? Um, and like we talked about before, when we looked at the dot product, we can use the dot product to project against a like an infinite line. Um, and so that is called um, scalar projection. And so if we go go back to our our yesterday's lecture, so we have scalar projection here. So scalar projection means that um, I don't know if this is going to be useful, but let's see might be a little cluttered. But if we have a normalized vector, in this case a, and then we have a different vector, let's say this one, the scalar projection gives us the uh, perpendicular projection onto the normalized line, and we get the uh, signed distance uh, of this whole line here. So this is the distance we're getting when we're doing scalar projection. And, and for this like uh, projection interpretation to work, um, you have to, um, w at least one of them have to be normalized, but both of these are already normalized. This is a direction, it's normalized. This is the normal of the surface, which is usually also normalized as well. And so, and so we can use this projective property to get some more information that we want out of this, right? And so if we do the dot product, between the normal and the direction, uh, we're going to get this distance right here. So we're going to get this signed distance. Let's call this P for the projected distance. Okay, did that make sense so far? Just want to check. Um, Yes. Okay. Uh, this one I was confused about since the since I thought the only only one was normalized for scalar projection. Um, at least one has to be normalized. Both of them can be normalized, and then the the geometric interpretation of projection still works. Uh, the dot product itself. Uh, is not scalar projection. Um, at least one of the vectors have to be normalized for it to, to be uh, projecting in the way that we usually interpret it. Um, and so, so this hat means that it's normalized. Um, yeah. And so, yes, Carolina got it right. There we go. I don't, I don't know how you draw that hat. Or wait, it's the that one. Yeah, okay. Didn't you say that if both are normalized, it will fall within the unit circle? Uh, yes, it will. Well, it would be the... Um, if both are normalized, the value will be between negative 1 to 1. If both are normalized, yeah. Um, 
So yeah, at least one has to be normalized for this projective uh, interpretation to work. And in our case, both of them are already normalized as they are. Um, you, you basically, you don't always draw the hat if it's normalized. Uh, quite often you only draw the hat if you want to normalize a vector that is not normalized. Uh, but in this case, both of them are already normalized. Um, but we could, we could draw the hat just to be extra clear. Um, and one thing you're going to notice if you start reading math papers is that people are very inconsistent with notation. Um, <laughs> so you're going to have to get used to that. Um, <clears throat> okay, all right. So, um, so now that we have, now that we know this distance, uh, we know the kind of the, the projected distance of D onto the normal, right? Uh, so this is again, this is kind of like the, the infinite line of the normal, just extending to infinity, right? Um, which direction vector was P? P is currently just a value, like a, a distance value. Um, so P is the signed distance of where this vector would get projected uh, along the normal. Um, and so in this case, this number, um, assuming again, this is normalized, so this should be a length of one, and then down here should be negative one. And so this is probably a value of negative 0.6 or something. Uh, because again, it's a signed distance, uh, distance along this vector, if that makes sense. Um, so like if it was here, it would have been 0.5. If it's here, it's one. Uh, if it's here, it's two. Uh, if it's here, it's negative one. If it's here, it's negative two and so forth. Um, and so now what we have is this um, projected distance. Okay. And so, as we observed before, the, these two are mirror images of each other. And so as soon as we've figured out this projected distance, then we basically have this full distance right here. Uh, because if P is this distance and this distance is the same, then the full distance here is 2p, right? Um, and so if we want to find this reflected vector, all we really have to do is to traverse from this point upwards, or rather along the normal, by this distance uh, times 2. And so now we can basically write our formula. Um, so the reflected vector, uh, I need to organize my desk. All right, I think this was the one that Carolina solved by accident. <laughs> which is always fun when you do that. Okay, so, so now what we wanna do is we wanna start from the vector here, the distance or our um, direction, and then we wanna move upwards. So we wanna start with our direction as our starting point. Uh, and then we wanna add the uh, extra displacement here. So from here to here. So now we need to find this vector, right? Um, one thing that is a little bit special about this vector is that this value is going to be negative um, because we're on the opposite side. We're, we're behind the normal. Um, the projected value in this whole region is always going to be negative, And in this whole region, it's always going to be positive. Uh, so keep in mind that this is a negative distance. So we're going to have some sign flipping things we need to keep in mind. Uh, so if we want to add, if we want to find this vector, um, if we just do, um, let's see, if we just do 2 times um, p times the uh, normal, 
then this is actually going to be uh, negative. It's going to point along the opposite direction of the normal. Uh, so we actually need to introduce a sign flip for this one. Uh, so we're going to negate that. Y times the normal, uh, because uh, P is currently just a number. But if we want to offset or get an offset from this to up here, we need to work with vectors, right? So we need to add a vector to this position that moves it up to the reflected position. Uh, so if we multiply by the normal, <clears throat> um, we're, we're basically doing the vector projection. Um, so we have our vector projection here. So scalar projection just gives us the signed distance, but vector projection gives us the, um, the vector at that distance offset. Um, so 2pn, or rather pn in and of itself, gives us this vector. Uh, but that vector is pointing in the wrong direction if we want to go from here to here, right? And so we're going to have to negate that. And then we're also going to have to multiply by 2 because we want to move it twice, like first up there and then move it up again to, to hit our reflected position. Um, why is my marquee an ellipse? That's illegal. Um, there we go. And so if we negate that, our final answer is going to be the direction minus 2 times the uh, projection here uh, times the normal. Um, and I guess we can write it out fully. So we move this. Because um, we have a dot product here. And the dot product was between the normal and the uh, direction. Um, so we have our direction and the normal. So this is our, this is how to reflect a vector. Um, what happens when you multiply a vector? Um, you change, um, you basically get a vector that's pointing in the same direction, but the length has been multiplied by that number. Um, and if you have a vector with length of one, the number you multiply it with will be the final length of the vector. Um, we talked about that briefly during the last lecture, but that is kind of the, the beauty of normalized vectors. Uh, if you have a vector in any direction that has a length of one, if you multiply that multiply that by say three, then you're going to get a vector in the same direction that is three times as long. Um, so if this is v, then this is v. Um, well, I guess um, if this is v, then this is three times v. Um, yeah. Um, let's see, if it was, uh, let's see, r equals d minus d dot n times n, what would happen? I assume it would be the opposite of d. Um, if you, if you omit the two here, um, you will, you will change this offset here, right? Um, and so, so what's going to happen is that if you just do, uh, d dot n and omit the two, uh, you're going to get the vector uh, pointing here. So it's going to go tangent to the calculation, or tangent to the, um, sorry, the reading chat at the same time, tangent to the surface rather than um, reflecting along it, right? Um. When I checked my answer, I watched a video and he explained the same thing, but I also brought up the division line on the image. Yes. Um, and so this is an alternate way you can write the uh, vector projection. 
the um, so if you have uh, a um, a hat dot b and then multiply that by a um, you can actually do this in a different way which can sometimes be useful if you don't have normalized vectors. Um, you can do a dot b divided by um, b dot p. And then you multiply that by, sorry, it should be a. Damn it, damn it, damn it, it's over. Bad math course. And now I did something with my layer. <laughs> oh no. Oh no, what did I do? Does anyone know why my layer is red? Okay, I think I got it. So a dot a, and then you multiply that whole thing with a. Um, so both of these are vector projection. Um, <clears throat> um, and so I think I included this in my, yeah, I, I have this on my website. I made a little test website at some point. Um, uh, so if you want to learn about the dot products, I made a little, little website where you can look at scalar projection and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> um, so you sort of have this interactive way to see what scalar projection means and how it works. Um, and again, the scalar projection, you can also write that in two different ways. Um, but in this case, we were doing a vector projection. And here we have the, the formula that I just wrote, right? Where you can either use a normalized vector like this, or if it's not normalized, uh, the, the method on the right will actually, in and of itself, normalize um, the whole thing, and it's going to work the same way. Okay, um, is the result the same if we dot product the negative of the direction with the normal instead of multiplying with negative two? Uh, yes, um, it's going to be the same results. Um, if you, um, so if you, if your incoming direction, if you flip it to the, to the other side, I believe the math, um, the math will basically work out to be something similar, but it'll basically just be a sign flip that works. I forget exactly how the geometric interpretation would would work here, um, but yeah, you, you can do that if you if you want to, and it's going to work out to be the same thing. Um, is it correct to say that you don't need to divide if you're dealing with normalized vectors? Uh, yes. Is this going to be on the test? I don't know if we have tests. Do we have tests? Anyway, we should implement this because we actually haven't checked if I got the math right. Um, and so maybe that's a good idea. Um, so now that we have figured this out, we can go back to our code. <clears throat> um, all right, uh, where's our code? Okay, so So when you, when you have functions like this, where we have something that's relatively isolated, like reflection, it can be useful to make a separate function for that. So we're going to do that. Um, so we're going to make a function called reflect. And it's always good to, to make sure that um, you're clear with what direction this is in. And because when you're dealing with reflect functions, like is this the incoming vector or is it reversed? Because quite often you you sometimes use either. Um, so we're going to call this in direction. And then um, we need the normal of the surface, right? <coughs> Excuse me. OK. You know what? I'm going to call it n. There, because I'm spicy. That's not very descriptive, but I guess we can do this. 
There we go. Um, I'm just kidding. Don't don't document your your cut. Documentation is overrated. Um. All right. So now we basically just take our math and just apply it to to our code. Um. So we have our um, out for it. Um, we have our direction. Uh, so that is going to be, we want to return the indirection uh, minus two times the uh, dot product between the two. Uh, let's make that intermediate variable. That's the, the projected distance. <clears throat> um, Uh, and then we multiplied that by the normal. Uh, the projected distance, that is the dot product between the indirection and the normal. And that should be it. I believe. <coughs> Um, how do you get yourself into a position where you get a surface normal that's not normalized? Um, so this happens a lot in rendering. Um, I can explain why during the next break. So remember to, to ask me. Um, all right, so we have our reflect function and now we just need to see if it works. So let's do another ray. Or let's draw another ray. So we need our reflected direction. Uh, that's going to be reflect. We have the ray direction. Um, and then we have the hit dot normal. Must not be equal. Uh, must not be equal. <laughs> I don't know how to type. I'm sorry. OK, gizmos dot draw line. We're going to draw from the hit point to hit point plus the reflected um, the reflected direction. I guess we're mixing vector twos and vector threes right now, so that's probably why it's a little sad. Then maybe we want to draw this with a different color. Um, did we use colors in this one? Oh, it's white. Well, that's not very useful. I guess, I guess we'll make this one white. And then we'll make this one red. OK. Theoretically, we should get our bounce direction if I got my math right. That's looking looking pretty correct. Um, ow, 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 ow. So we have our laser, it's hitting a point, and it seems to be bouncing correctly, as far as, far as I can tell. Um, usually with, with this reflection function, um, you can sometimes get results that are similar to correct, but not actually correct. Um, shallow angles will usually tell you pretty quickly, um, or you will make it very clear whether or not you got it right. Um, and we can see that the shallow angles are also looking correct. Um, the angle between the surface and the direction has to be the same on either side, and it looks like we got that. Um, yeah, and so this was a bit of an exercise in trying to reason about the dot product and build intuitions about like when is it useful to project things and how how all well that works out and why it's useful. Um, obviously, a lot of these functions are built in. Um, there is a uh, vector two dot reflect that does this for you. Um, and so, so you, you obviously shouldn't write this in every project you do. It's kind of unnecessary to reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, and so you would probably just use the built-in reflect function, but I wanted this to kind of be an exercise in, uh, reasoning about the dot products. Um, okay. Is there a reason to use vector twos here? Um, 
The math will basically be the same, but because we're doing this in a 2D scene, um, I don't want the ray to accidentally like shoot off into the, the depth of the scene. Um, and it's also cheaper to do math using vector twos because there's one less component to deal with. Um, and so it's just unnecessary to use 3D vectors in this case, but it will work. Like the, the math that we've written here, we just changed this to vector threes. It's gonna work just fine. Um, there's there's gonna be no, no difference. The math is the same. Um, okay. Uh, any questions about that? So far. Did that make sense? So this was kind of the, the core of the assignment was to figure this out. Um, and then the kind of the, the secondary thing is to then draw a bouncing laser. I haven't done that part, but could do that if you want to, but you know. Uh, can this be done in just one line that extends for X length but bounces each time? Um, yeah, you can set a set a maximum uh, length limit for your raycast. Uh, so all you need to do is keep track of how much length you have left after every bounce. Um, so yes, you can do that. If you want a laser that has a maximum distance, you can totally do that. Um, the kittens have finally calmed down. Um, on the draw line that you can see. Um, do you mean to only draw draw the line between the two points, or? Um, then yes. Like currently, I'm drawing the. Um, line in the direction, but I can I can draw the line like from the origin to the hit position too. Um, so um, if I draw it from the origin of the ray and then I draw it to the hit dot point, uh, then it's going to draw like a full laser beam from the from the origin to the point. Yeah. If that's what you were asking, I'm not sure. It's just that I, I was only drawing the direction. I wasn't drawing the um, the full line from point A to point B. Okay. Um, my rays for some reason shooting left even though my direction is transformed dot right. Uh, make sure that your pivot is set to local. It's a very common thing that sometimes you have the pivot set to the wrong one, and so you, you don't actually get the uh, correct direction when you look in the scene view. Um, and then, yeah, make sure your scene orientation is correct as well. Um, like right now in the top right, you can see that I'm, I'm on the XY plane, um, so make sure you're not on some other other plane. Okay. Uh, pivot is local and the scene is in the XY plane. Um, then I'm guessing maybe the code that draws your ray might be reflected somewhere or mirrored. Oh yeah, make sure Y is pointing up and X is pointing right in up here in your in your scene view thing because it's possible to be on either side, right? You can either be on the front or you can be on the back. Mm 
That looks correct, so I'm guessing it's a scene setup thing. Oh wait, your gizmos are draw right is you have origin plus direction here. Um well I guess I don't have that anymore, but uh you're using draw ray. And in that case, uh you don't need origin here. Uh so you should omit origin from this one. Um Yeah, so, so Ray takes an origin and a direction, so you would do this. Uh, if you're using draw line, uh, then you need to have origin here. Does that make sense why? The, the, the line requires like world space coordinates for exactly where you want it to start and where you want it to end. Uh, draw ray assumes that you want to add the origin to the endpoint already. Um, so it, it originates from the origin and then offsets by the direction here. Okay. Um. All right, do you want me to do the full like bouncing like for loop stuff or should we move on? Because this was kind of the, the core of the, the assignments. You would like to see the bounce. Okay, you're fine. Uh, two votes for bounce, three votes for bounce. Uh, four. Uh, <laughs> let's bounce. Are you leaving? Are you leaving my math class? Jeez. Okay. Bounce. Let's do it. Um. Uh. <laughs> Shoutouts to... I'm a me in YouTube chat who says bounce for fuck's sake. It's called reflection. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm sorry, students. I misspoke. Uh, I have ruined your math education by using the, the technically incorrect terminology. I'm very sorry. All right. So we need to iterate, right? We want this to bounce multiple times. So it's probably good to have some sort of integer for, um, uh, we need some sort of integer for the maximum number of bounces. It's probably a bad idea to make it bounce infinitely until it escapes. Uh, cause we could, we could lock the entire application and get stuck in a stack overflow. Uh, so we, we don't want to do that. Um, so we're going to set a max number of bounces. Um, we're going to set that to. I don't know, 40. We need to bounce on what we did now. That's true. It's it's always good to to bounce um, on what you just learned. Um, okay, so um, we're gonna do this in every for loop. Oh God, my throat is very sad. Doing lectures one day after another makes my voice very coarse and sad, as you can hear. <coughs> um, my college math teacher would throw stuff at us if we used the wrong terminology. Like, it matters if you get into, like, super precise proofs and definitions, if you're writing, like, a, like a math paper. But like, if I was using accurate terminology, like none of you would understand anything if I was using the most mathematically precise terminology. Um, and, and this is kind of the problem with like math Wikipedia. If you look up like any math concept on Wikipedia, it's going to be almost unreadable because it's going to be so generalized and so precise that it's really hard to intuit what they even mean. Um, but if you explain it using natural language, you can actually understand what I'm talking about. And that's why I'm not using the most hyper accurate nerdy terminology because that makes it useless. Um, 
Okay. All right. Uh, we don't want we don't want upper. That is a weird weird name for this. We're gonna use max bounces. Uh, might want to make this public so we can edit it. Um, all right. And so now, uh, for every step, we have to modify the ray because we need to ray cast from a different direction after every iteration, right? Um, so our reflected direction is going to be the, the new outgoing direction, right? So we're going to set ray.direction equals reflected. And then the origin is going to be the uh, hit point, right? And so I believe, um, let's see, so this is using origin here, but instead we're going to use uh, ray.origin because we're modifying ray.origin, but we're not modifying these um, across every iteration. Um, and I believe that is it. So now we're iterating there. Um, if the ray misses, which means we're shooting off into infinity, uh, then we break the for loop because even if we try again, it's going to miss. So, All right. <clears throat> so let's see if that works. Who knows? Maybe I got this wrong. Um, it does seem to work. That is at least two bounces. Neat. We did it. There's our, there's our, our laser. All right. Uh, how are we doing on time? 10.49. I think that means it's time for our 10 minute break. Um, okay, 10 minute break. We're resuming in, in, t in 10 minutes actually, uh, cause that's what a 10 minute break is. Uh, so time to go to the bathroom and get some tea or coffee or whatever it is you're, you're drinking. This is a good laser. I appreciate this laser. Let's bump the max number of bounces to something higher. I feel like there should be some fun critical mass angle somewhere. It's kind of a puzzle to figure out like how many bounces you get at every location. Anyway, um, now you know the basics to create your own GI system. Yeah, exactly. You're ready to write a renderer. 10 minute cat camera. Um, you know, they're kind of, oh, no, Thor is not napping. He's standing right next to me. Hello. YouTube chat when Freya uses bounces that are reflect. Here's, here's, here's a boy. Look at the boy. And there's another boy. Two boys. Okay, I need to go to the bathroom and I also need to feed the cats. So I'll be right back.
to refill the whole cat food bin. That's a big one. who is a very handsome man and also a baby. This is very accurate. It's a little toy. Toy boy. What a rotund gentleman, you know? Salad is a little more rotund than this boy. That's salad. This is big boy salad. This is Toast's brother. He's a very good boy. He's very fluffy. He's also got a beauty mark on his on his nose. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a tiny dot on his in the middle of his snoot. It's really cute. Oh, 
what's that? Yeah, what's that? Pop, 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 pop. You're so large. You're so large. You're so floppy. He's so floppy, goopy. What? What? <laughs> okay. Hey. Hey. Hey, little rascal. Little rascal. <sighs> so toast and salad are kittens. Um, technically. <laughs> but they're pretty large for their age. At least salad is. Salad is like 5.3 kilograms or something. Um, oh, someone had a question to talk about during the break, something about rendering in normals that aren't normalized. Oh, true. Um, yeah, we're kind of post break now, but whatever, it's fine. Um, uh, so the thing about that there, there are kind of two separate situations in rendering where you might run into non-normalized surface normals. Um, so if you, this is kind of going to get into shader and tech art stuff. Uh, so I'm not going to go too deep into this. Uh, but when you have a triangle in a mesh, uh, the normal of this surface, uh, if you're, if you're using face normals, uh, is going to just be based on the, the position of these three vertices, right? Um, so given the position of these three, we can calculate the normal from that using the cross product, which we're going to talk about soon. Um, but anyway, so this would be the face normal. Um, however, in rendering, there are, there's another type of normal, which is the vertex normals. So there's normals associated with each vertex, and these can point in different directions. Um, so this is kind of customized based on what the 3D model looks like. Um, and so you can have normals at vertices that point in wildly different directions. And when you're rendering some other part, like if you're rendering this pixel right here, the normals are interpolated across the triangle. Uh, and this is how smooth shading works. Um, the reason you can make a polygonal mesh look smooth is because it's interpolating or blending the normals. Um, and so if you have if you have a very polygonal mesh, like a hard edge like this, you have some, some vertices here. Um, how you set up the normals will depend, will determine how this corner is shaded. Uh, if we have normals that point like this and normals that point like this, in other words, we have two vertices at this location, uh, this is gonna be a hard edge. There's gonna be a hard cutoff for the shading at that location. Uh, but if you want that to look smooth, as in we want smooth shading, then it only has one normal pointing in that direction and that normal's here. And so then any values in between will be interpolated. So it's kind of like slowly bending the normal uh, across the surface. Uh, and this bending of the normal does not normalize automatically. Uh, so if you consider the, the unit circle um, and you want to blend between two normals, so you want to blend between, say, this normal and uh, this normal, then the values that are directly interpolating here are not normalized. So if we blend between these two, they're actually shorter than they're supposed to be. Um, so in, in your shaders, you actually have to normalize these vectors uh, if you want them to be accurately shading. That's one case where uh, you won't have normalized normals. Um, but that's mostly the, like an interpolation artifact. Um, <clears throat> another case where you're actually not going to have normalized normals uh, is because you can, 
It's a little bit complicated, but in, in meshes, you can actually bake data into the normals. Um, so sometimes you can actually intentionally make normals shorter. Uh, the side effect of that is that the lighting is going to get darker if you shorten the normals because of how lighting is set up in shaders, um, or at least traditionally. And so sometimes uh, meshes actually use normals to bake um, occlusion data as an ambient occlusion. Uh, so you can actually darken the lighting in certain parts of your mesh uh, by effectively altering the normals, uh, either making them shorter or longer. Uh, and that's going to basically make the uh, make that part darker. Um, so then you can bake that data into the vertices instead of like having a separate texture for ambient occlusion. Um, but anyway, that's that's not during this course. This is this is a this is this is a, this is for the shader course. Spoilers. We shouldn't do spoilers. Um, all right. We should resume. Resume math class. Um, I need to get an energy drink, so I'll be right back. Speedway in the apartment. If we're resuming, walk away. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, it's a real power move to say that we're back and then walk away. All right, um, any other questions about the laser or should we move on to the space transformation stuff? What, what's your, well, what, do, do you have any thoughts? Missed one part of the laser. Um, do you want the code or that's the code. The word normal slowly losing all meaning in my mind. Yeah, it's a it's a very it's a very overloaded term. It means a lot of things, um, unfortunately. Uh, all right, I'm guessing no questions about the reflect stuff. So I guess we can move on. Okay. All right, space transformations. This one is a little bit tricky. Uh, this one is tricky because it can be quite often like complicated to wrap your head around uh, like what it even means and what coordinates represent and what space you're working with and so forth. Um, and so it can, can be a little bit tricky. Um, and so again, it's a bit of an advanced thing because we didn't have time to talk about space as much. Um, Okay, well, let's let's go to that. I'm just moving things around a bit. You know, okay. Do I have my axes somewhere still? It'd be useful to have them intact. Mm. 
I guess I do. I felt like 3B was easier than 2. Uh, fascinating. That is uh, not what I intended, but fascinating if that's the case. Salad! <laughs> Boy! <laughs> Suddenly a cat approached in a rolling office chair. <laughs> he just rolled up to me. Hey, Goober. Goober Scooter. Wait, many of you found 3B easier? Huh, okay. Um, okay, that is extremely fascinating. Uh, I'm kind of curious why this is the case. Um, I guess that we might have different solutions. Um, okay, um, let's go. Let's go through spaces. Um, um, Mm, basic scalar projection for axes. Yes. You're missing one thing though. Um, it's not taking the position of the object into account. Um, but anyway, let's, let's, let's go through it. Um, and so if, I feel like something is going to break at some point. Um, let's set up a local space. Um, so we have some some position somewhere, and then we need some axes. So we have the x-axis, and we have the y-axis. Okay, so so imagine that this is a transform. So that will that will have a space in and of itself. Uh, so whenever we're measuring things like this, when we say that some vector represents a position, what we really mean is that it represents a position relative to some coordinate system, right? Um, in this case, we're, we're kind of just saying that this is world space. Um, and so this vector, if we give it the, the values of, let's see, it's two on the x-axis and one on the y-axis, um, the vector has no knowledge about space at all. It is just numbers. Uh, just like we don't know if five is the number of apples you have, or if it's the um, the height of an object in your possession. Like the the number has no knowledge about the context it's used for, right? Um, and so, so it's always good to keep in mind that they're they're kind of agnostic about what space they're in. So so the vector two one. In world space, it would have this location, right? If we're interpreting this as a world space location, then this would be the vector. Uh, but if we're interpreting this as a coordinate in local space of this object, then it's going to be different, right? Because then it's going to be two along this axis. So if it's one here, then it's two here. Uh, and then it's one unit along the y axis, because it's the y coordinate is one. Then this is also. Uh, two, one, but in local space, right? Um, and so we're basically just describing the same thing, but we just have a bit of an offset for, um, for, for like which coordinate system we're interpreting it as, um, as living in, right? Um, and so, so this is kind of how like local space versus world space coordinates work. Um, so, so yeah, um, and obviously these two have. Uh, different positions relative to the other coordinate system, right? Um, and so if we want to know where is this in world space, we need to find a way to, to convert from local space to world space, right? So then if we want to interpret this position, like the physical position of this, we would have to like calculate this vector, like pointing to uh, this position uh, from the world space coordinate system, right? Um, Okay, does that make sense? Just want to check because this is very, very useful to know.
Isn't this 3B? Uh, we're going to start with 3A and then we're going to do 3B. Right now I'm just kind of talking about spaces in general, um, how coordinate systems relate to each other, what it means to transform from one space to another and so forth. Um, why is there three vector arrows on that point? Um, do you mean this one or? Oh, so um, if you imagine this is a game object in Unity, uh, these uh, directions basically define the coordinate space of that transform. So, so if you look at an object in Unity, so let's say our laser, for instance, uh, you can see that we have these two arrows here, right? Um, and these are the, the axes of that object, representing the, uh, the orientation and the direction that, that the, the whole thing is pointing, right? Um, so if we rotate this one, uh, we rotate the, the local coordinate space of this one, right? And so if you have a child object, um, then the coordinates you're setting here are in local space, right? So if we set this to position one or two and one, um, you can see that we have an object over there. Um, and so two and one <clears throat> is now the local space position of this object. So if we move the laser, um, it moves in world space, but it's still the same uh, local offset in the local coordinate space of this laser object, right? Uh, so the local coordinates of the child object is still 2, 1, because it's just relative to this object, right? Uh, so this is kind of, kind of what you do when you um, add child objects to something. Uh, they, they become relative to their parent objects. Um, and so the coordinates you have here, 2, 1, is always in, in local space of the parent object. Uh, but if we move the parent, the parent is obviously changing its coordinates uh, because that one is relative to the world origin because it doesn't have a parent, right? Um, yeah, so th that's what the, the two axes are here. So this kind of represents a game object. Okay. Um, I hope that made sense. I'm gonna clean a few things up. So now, the goal is to figure out how to transform from local space to world space. Um, uh, let's, let's, let's strategically move our game object. Let's move. Let's move it over over there. I think that's that's a good one. Okay. <clears throat> um. All right. So the first assignment was to figure out how do we transform something from uh, local space to world space. In other words, what is the position of this object here or this this coordinate in world space? So we want this vector rather than the local space vector here. Uh, and so the world space vector uh, is gonna have different values. And so we can see that this one is at negative three on the x-axis and four on the y-axis. Um, so the, the coordinates of this one is gonna be negative three um, and four. And so it represents the, the same physical position in the world, but it's just relative to a different coordinate system. Um, okay, I hope that makes sense. This, this is something you're gonna have to wrap your head around a lot. Um, and it's very useful once you've gotten used to working with spaces. Um, but if, especially if you're doing shader programming, you're gonna juggle between like four different spaces. Um, and so it's, it's really, really useful to to get a get a sense of how spaces work. Um, all right, so this would be our um, this is our local 
local space coordinate. And this is our world space coordinate. They represent the same position, just relative to different coordinate spaces. Okay, so how do we, how do we do this? How do we convert from one to another? Um, well, to convert from local to world, you're, you actually only need very like elementary vector operations, uh, because what we're really doing is, if you remember, this transform also has a position, right? Like there's a line, a vector going from the origin to the origin of this transform. That is basically transform dot position. That is what this is, right? And so we have this vector in world space. So we know this offset. And then if you want to uh, get to this local position, uh, something we can then do is we can take the axis here, the x-axis, and multiply it by the x-coordinate. So if we add that to this position, we're going to add and we're going to traverse all the way here. And then we can take the y-coordinates, multiply that by the y-axis, and we're going to move to our final position here. Um, and so really that's all you need to do. You need to uh, basically, you take each of the basis vectors, these are called basis vectors, uh, multiply them by your coordinates individually, uh, and then add them all up. And then you're going to get the world space position, because these axes are already in world space. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one way you can, you can go from local to world. Um, do you want me to do this in code as well, or are you fine just having the illustrated explanation? Please show in code. Okay. Um, all right, let's clean this up a little bit. So we're going to do transformation. Unity would show both local and world positions in the inspector, no matter the situation. Um, might be useful sometimes, yeah. Although I don't think I've ever found it useful. I think I always want the local space coordinate. On drug is mess. All right. Um, so now we want to. Uh, transform something from uh, local space to world space. So first off, we need some sort of local space coordinate. Uh, and so we're going to make a, a local coordinate. So we're just going to make that an inspector variable that we can tweak. Um, and then we can draw. Um, so gizmos dot draw sphere. We can draw that at, just use our local coordinate here. Um, but this is going to draw in world space. So now we're going to interpret the local coordinate in world space. And so what's going to happen now is that we're drawing this sphere, right? But when we move this object around, it doesn't follow it at all. If you rotate it, uh, the point is just fixed in world space. Um, so if we change our local coordinate um, like this, um, it's not relative to our local space at all. It's just world space. So now the question is, how do we convert it to um, from local space to world space? Okay, let's make a function. Uh, 
goodness, kittens, chill your beans. Um. All right. So we need to convert this to world space. Uh, so we're going to do world position equals local to world. And we pass our local coordinate in there. And now we need to figure out how to write this function. Um, so a good starting point for this is that um, if we, we can use the origin of this object as our starting point, uh, because we know the world space position of this object, right? Um, because the final vector we want is this long vector right here, right? Um, so a good starting point is to uh, just add the position of the uh, transform itself. Um, so our final position um, is going to be transform.positions, that's the origin. And then we can add two offsets. And we have the local space coordinates. We know that it is uh, two units along the x-axis, and it's one unit along the y-axis. Uh, and so we can take these two coordinates and multiply by these vectors. So if we take two and multiply it by this vector, we get the vector pointing twice as far, right? So we can take this vector, we can add this vector, and then we get here. And then we do the same thing for the y vector. We take the, the y vector, multiply it by our y coordinate, and then we get the vector offset. And we're going to end up exactly at the point where we want to go. Um, and so what, basically what you do is you take the local um, x coordinate, multiply it by the transform dot right. That's the, the x axis. Um, in this case, it's sad because transform.right is a vector 3. Um, and then we do the same thing for the y-coordinate. Take the y-coordinate and transform.up because that's the y-axis. So x-axis, y-axis, and then that's our position. Okay. Uh, and that, that should work. Let's let's see what it looks like. Will it work if you do transform.position.normalized? Uh, no, because then you're going to get the, you're going to take this position and you're going to clamp it to the unit circle. So it's going to become very short. And so you're going to get the incorrect position. OK, so now it's following our objects and it's respecting the rotation just fine. Uh, we set the local coordinate to zero. It's exactly on the object. If we increase x, it's going to move along the local x-axis. We set it to negative values. It's on the negative side. Uh, if we change y, it's going to move along the y-axis and so forth. And so now we've successfully converted from our local space coordinates to world space. Um, yeah. OK, did that make sense? And the, the reason we can take the component and multiply it by these uh, basis vectors is because these are also normalized. They have a length of 1, and so that if we multiply it by 2, the final length is going to be exactly 2 um, of, of that vector. Uh, yes, I can show the code again. Oh, use the wrong coordinate. Okay, gotcha. Salad. Hey. No, no. Hey. No. There are criminal activities over here. 
Uy. I don't want him to, to pull the barometer off the wall. Um. Okay. Uh, is everything clear so far? It looks like it is, right? People are typing. Um. Okay, I think we're good, right? Are we ready for local to world? Or sorry, world to local? Sorry, I'm muted. Um, okay. No, I was just saying that there's there's a non-zero chance that the kittens are going to like knock a glass to the floor and I'm going to have to go deal with that because they're very zoomies right now. Okay. All right. Thanks for the water reminder. Um, okay, world to local. Um, this one is a little bit harder to debug because usually debugging happens in world space. Um, not necessarily, you can make it do make it in local space, but it gets into complicated things too early. Um, so I think this time, uh, let's supply a world space coordinate through a game object. So world space transform. Um, actually, should we do this in a separate script? Probably not. Let's just comment this out. Okay, so this time we're gonna have a world space position. Um, we can do a vector too, it's easier that way. Um, and then we can debug it, draw it at the world coordinate. Um, just to go back and make sure it works. Okay, so we have a world space coordinate now. We can move it along the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, and now we need to figure out the local space coordinate of this point. All right. So, um, that is going to be a little bit of a different process. Okay, so let's, um, let's erase this. Um, let's see, do we erase that one? No. All right, so now we want to do the opposite. We want to go from a world space position to a local space position. So, so now we're starting with, with this vector, so the world space uh, interpretation of that coordinate, and we want to figure out the local space coordinate. 
Um, and this is going to be a pretty similar process, except it's kind of all reversed. Um, and so first off, a good starting point is to get the relative vector rather than the local vector. Uh, in other words, um, boys, don't fight. Uh, in other words, we, we might want to get this vector. So if I draw this vector, um, this can either be in local space or world space, right? I haven't specified. Um, so we can do this offset in world space or local space, but we want to find the local space version of this, right? Um, but if we take uh, the world space coordinate here and the world space coordinate here and subtract them from each other, we're going to get this world space vector, right? The, the direction from one to the other. Um, in other words, this is still in world space. I'm drawing it next to the local space, but keep in mind that this is still a world space vector. It's in the world space coordinate system, not the local space coordinate system. Um, so if this is a world relative direction from the origin to the point, um, we then need to figure out what are its values? Because we still don't know these values right now. So, so these are still what we're trying to figure out. Like what, it, what are the uh, local space coordinates for, for this vector, right? Um, so what we really want to know, again, coordinates are kind of the, the projected locations on the x-axis and the y-axis, right? Um, so, so what we're really doing here is that the coordinates represent the projected distance along each axis. And this is effectively the dot product, right? If we consider the direction of this axis with a, with a, with a unit vector, the basis vector here, um, we can do the vector or the scalar projection. We can take this vector, project it onto the x-axis, and then we're going to get this value here that represents the x coordinate. And so we get x out of it. And then we. There's some cat fights going on. And then we do the same thing for the y axis. So we get the y uh, coordinate here by projecting it against the, uh, the basis vector or the y axis. Um, and so we can do that with this vector. Um, we take the dot product between the y-axis and this world space vector. And then we're going to end up getting the coordinate here, which end up, ends up being 1 in this case. Uh, and then we do the same thing for the x-axis. We project it onto this axis, and the length here is going to be 2. Um, and so that's how we can go from, um, from world to local. So in this case, it's going to be 2 on the x-axis. Uh, and on the y-axis, uh, it's going to be 1. OK. And so that's how we do uh, world to local. Uh, all right. I'm guessing you want to see that in code as well. So I'm going to do that in code. <clears throat> so world to local, uh, we start with a world position. All right. So first off, we want to get the relative vector uh, between our world space coordinate and the world space location of the local coordinate, right? Or of the uh, of the object that contains this coordinate space. Um, so again, we start out by um, taking our world space coordinate. Let's call this W, um, and subtracting it uh, by the position here. Um, so, so this vector here is going to be W, uh, minus P. Um, so again, this is still world space. It's just that it's the vector from here to here in this coordinate system. Um, so this is our relative vector. Um, so usually, um, I, usually I call these relative vectors. Um, there we go, R rel. That's going to be our, our relative vector. Um, or you can call it a delta or a displacement, whichever, whichever one you like. OK. 
Okay. Um, so now we have this vector in world space, but now we need to convert it to local space. All right, so now we're, we need to do the, the scalar projections against each axis, and the scalar projection will give us uh, how far along it is along that axis. Um, so it's the dot product between this vector in world space and this vector in world space. That will give us the local space x coordinate. And so we can do each component separately. Um, so the x coordinate is going to be the dot product between the relative vector and the, um, the x axis. So x-axis, and then we do the same thing for the y-axis. Um, so transform dot up is the y-axis, and that is our local space coordinate. If we would add in scale in the transformation, would we just multiply it, multiply it with a scale, or is it more complicated? Um, I believe all of this will work um, if the scale is baked into the um, axes. Uh, how do you duplicate a line? I don't know what the built-in shortcut is. I just have a hotkey set up for that. Um, in my case, it's Control Shift D. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what the default is because I think that's custom. Control D and writer. Right. I have control D bound to a different thing. Uh, control D is select next match for me. Um, very useful when you're doing like, if I want to change all of these to vector three, I can just do that. Um, but so I control shift D for duplicate and control D for select next match. Um, okay. And yes, there are many ways of doing this. Uh, there's no one solution. Um, and so if your stuff is working, that's good. Um, hmm. Um, let's see. Is that code working? Or, wait, is that code not working or is it working? So transform all position minus. Uh, it is working. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so, uh, I guess we can just output the local space coordinate in the inspector. It's not going to be very exciting, but we can just do that, I suppose. Uh, so we can calculate the local space coordinate from our world, world space coordinate. And so, um, this is just going to be for updating it in the inspector. It's a little bit illegal to change your serialized values in Androgismos, but that's okay. Um, all right, let's see. Let's move it to some more simple values. Uh, so now our world space coordinate is matching the local coordinate. It might be hard to read this, so you're going to have to trust me. Um, I don't know if you trust me, but hopefully you do. Um, and so now if we move this one, uh, the local space coordinate is decreasing, so now the local space coordinate is one, one. If we rotate it like this, it's now zero on the y-axis and it's 1.41 on the x-axis. And yeah, it seems to be, seems to be working. And so, so I believe, I believe we did it. Um, so this, this would be the, the solution to uh, 3a uh, and this is 3 Um, 
All right. Any questions about this? No questions. We're mostly talking about duplicating lines and IDs. Okay. It's still really fascinating that it seems like the majority of all of you found local to world to be more complex than world to local. Um, that's fascinating to me. Because to me, this one is harder to figure out um, than local to world. Because for a local to world, you kind of have all of the vectors you need, and you're only using like elementary like vector addition uh, and scaling. But did a good job with the scalar projection. Oh, that's a very, very optimistic and positive outlook. That sounds great. I like that, that narrative. <laughs> they might have been stuck in dark product tunnel vision. Yeah, yeah, true. I talk about it a lot. Uh, my local to world was really complicated. Uh, oh yeah, that is really complicated. Uh, yeah, you don't have to do it that way. You can also do it this way. Oh, a lot of you had trouble because you thought it was too simple. Valid. That that is. That is a concern. Um. Okay. So you, <laughs> all right. So you got stuck on the one that I thought was easier. Oh no. All right. Well, that's that's interesting. Um. Okay. Let's see. How are we doing on time? Uh, Jesus Christ! Time is just disappearing into the ether. We've just been doing the assignments. We haven't even gotten into the new stuff we're going to talk about today. Um. But, uh, but okay. Um, uh, let's see. I'm guessing you are fine with more lectures after lunch, are you? I don't know how tired you are. If, you, if you're like, ah, oh, shit, I'm overloaded with math. Ideally, we would do more lectures after lunch. I think that's the most cost efficient use of time. Uh, and then tomorrow you're gonna have, uh, tomorrow you're gonna have assignments to work on. Uh, okay, oh yeah, we have lunch coming up. Um, I think it is, of course we'd like to study more after lunch. I mean, when I, put the hours in. Some people were like, what are we going to go all the way from nine to 16 or 50? I forget. Um, and so I was a little bit worried that you were like, oh, this is too, too, too long. <laughs> uh, that was you. Okay. So I, I, I'll blame you. It's all your fault. You did. Jeez. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's too... Uh, we don't have time to get into the things I want to get into uh, before lunch because um, it's kind of a whole new topic. Um, so if you have any questions about things we've talked about so far, then then this is the time to, to ask those questions. Um, I think it was from the perspective of a normal math lesson. Those are hell for retention and energy. Uh, that's true, I guess. <laughs> See, you're using the word normal again. Isn't this getting really confusing? What do we mean by normal? 
we're going on lunch now. Uh, yes, we are done with the, the things we're going to talk about before lunch. So feel free to go for lunch. I'm going to stick around until 12 uh, in case you have questions. Um, so, so yeah, um, if, if you have to go for lunch or go out with your dog, then, then go for it. Um, but I'm going to stick around until 12. We're going to resume at 13. Um, yeah, so 13 is going to be the, when we, when we get back to the next part of the lecture. Um, okay. The... Actually, how do I do this on YouTube? Do I split this up into two separate videos? Maybe this is going to be the the assignment video because we've only we've only gone through the assignments, so maybe that can be the assignments video, and then and then the second one is going to be the new stuff. Um. Oh yeah, I guess I can read YouTube chat if there's anyone on YouTube that has thoughts or questions or or whatever. This would be a good time before we head off for lunch. Uh, can't you just put on a splash screen like on Twitch? I guess I could. Uh, the problem is that YouTube videos that are longer than four hours don't get automatic captions. And captions are really important for a lot of people. Um, and if I make the video longer than four hours, they're not going to automatically generate and I will get infinite amounts of comments going, why are there no captions? And because YouTube doesn't tell anyone that it doesn't do captions for videos longer than four hours, nobody knows this is the case. So I have to deal with the endless barrage of comments like that. That's a very strange limit. It is, right? Um... Okay. Can I use some AI to generate the captions? Yeah, that's the thing. Like if you if you're using an AI, but why 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 not just do it for for longer for, for longer videos? I don't get it. <laughs> it's so weird. Um. Oh, question. Uh, why don't we add that to the new world position? Maybe explain three B one more time if that's okay. Um. Why don't we add that to the new world position? Um, what exactly are you... Which part? Um, are you wondering about like why we do this relative vector thing? Or like 22? Line 22. Um, So we want the local space position, right? So we don't want to add the world space position to this um, because we, we want the position relative to the local coordinate system. Uh, in other words, we want, oh God, Photoshop is so janky sometimes. Uh, we want this vector in local space, right? Um, but if we add this position, um, we're going to get well, we're going to get very incorrect results. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to get uh, this position uh, plus this vector, but interpreted in world space. So we would get this position in world space, uh, which is not correct. Um, so we want the local coordinates, not the world coordinates uh, for that point. Um. Okay. I also have a question. Go for it. Fire away. Uh, I use a separate game object for the script and two other objects for local point and world point. What should I replace your transform dot position with on each of my method? Um, so transform dot position is the uh, the local coordinate space, right? Uh, so you would replace it with your 
with the the object that is here, the the object that you're moving around, right? Um, and if we're using a transform for this one, um, if you want to use that as your local coordinate when you're doing local to world, uh, you're gonna have to read transform dot local position of this object if you have a transform here, uh, if that's how you set up your code. Um. Okay. Any other questions before before I go before we go to lunch break? I think on YouTube I'm gonna stop the stream and then restart it after. Um. Yeah, I'm gonna restart it uh, after lunch. Okay. No more questions. Are we all, are we all super clear on everything? I will also send this in case you want this over lunch for whatever reason. Ah. Okay, no questions from the students. Uh, when will the post-lunch stream start? Uh, in the lunch break is gonna be one hour. So it's gonna be one hour from, one hour and five minutes from now. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put up a YouTube um, upcoming stream for the next one too. So you can, you can just tune into that. I should probably rename this one to um, like part part one assignments. Part two A, part two B. Oh geez, I don't know what to, how to name this. Assignment solutions. I don't know how to how to. I guess I can change the name later. Maybe it doesn't matter. Because if I just say part one assignments, people might think that it's just the assignments themselves, but not the solution to them. Naming is hard. Uh, all right, I think we are good for lunch then. Uh, mm -mm -mm. No questions there. Okay. Solutions for assignment one, but it was three assignments, right? And so it, it's, it's gonna sound like that. That's gonna sound like it's just a solution for assignment one. So, you know. Mm. Does faucet have an equivalent in English? I'm not sure. I don't remember any. Anyway, part one assignment solutions. That sounds great. Let's just go for that. Uh, okay. Um, we're going to be back at 1300 local time. Um, so if you're, if you're in Sweden, then that's when we're going to resume. It's in an hour from now. Uh, for those of you on YouTube, I'm gonna I'm gonna put up a separate stream. So so as usual, just just like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the bell and all of that stuff, so you get notifications for when we start again. Um, so 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 be on the lookout for that. I'm gonna put up the uh, the next 
the next stream on YouTube as well. So, but it's going to be different from the current page you're in. Lecture one assignments, the truth. <laughs> the truth come out. Um, okay, cool. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, as, oh yeah, feel free to join my Discord server. There's a link in chat in case you want to go there. Um, I, I should set up like chat messages on my hotkeys, but I don't have that right now. Um, but yeah, so, so feel free to do that and I will see you all in an hour, I guess. I'm going to eat. Um, you should also eat. And there's also the, there's a salad over there in case you need to see a salad before we head off. I think that's important. There's salad. Look at salad. Salad. Hello? Hello, Salad? Oh, that's, that's good scratches. Oh, good scratches. Oh, good boy. Salad says goodbye. Okay. All right. Thanks for joining. See you all in an hour. Um, so how do I end streams? I don't know how to end streams. YouTube's weird. Okay, there's the button. All right, bye everyone. See you in a bit. <laughs>